Welcome Climate Viewers. My name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, and weathermodificationhistory.com. It's April 29th, 2018, and today we're going to talk about chemtrails, morgellons, Lyme disease, and a whole lot of bullshit associated with um, morgellons. I'd like to get the facts out there. And I think I've got an expert on the show today who's going to really break it down for you. Of course, all of my work is free of charge. You will not see any advertisement on climateviewer.com or any of my websites. So please support my work over at patreon.com slash climateviewer. Our guest today is Jeremy Murphy. Um, you can check him out on Facebook. Right here. Um, and here is his uh, Facebook page at Morgellon Survey. His website is morgellonsurvey.org. Um, you can support his work by scrolling down here. There's a nice little donate button. Hope you guys will do that as well. Um, and he has a blog as well on there that you can check out, along with a YouTube channel. Uh, rocking a thousand subscribers already i'm subscribed make sure you click that bell so you get the updates and uh with that let's bring up our guest for today jeremy glad to have you here brother man <laughs> and this is great and i uh, gotta thank everybody for helping us get past a thousand subscribers absolutely thank you for doing your part yeah man i appreciate you uh hounding me on the subject of morgellons I'm completely uneducated on this. So on this particular video, I'm going to be learning some things just along with the audience. I'm doing this because, you know, I talk a lot about planes making clouds, um, commonly referred to as chemtrails on the Internet. And I try to, you know, break down the science behind it, how metal makes clouds and how breathing metal is a bad thing and how clouds affect climate and generally piss a whole lot of people off. So. What we want to do today really is get into this whole relation between chemtrails and morgellons and what are the facts. Um, so with that, we're going to, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, there seems to be a, not seems to be, there is a direct scientific link between Lyme disease and morgellons. Why don't you go ahead and give uh, the audience an explanation because you could probably do it better than me. Sure, and I'll try to keep it brief, actually. Um, basically, what's happened is Lyme bacteria is discovered whenever they do a study of a Morgellons patient inside the lesions of that patient. Now, previously, when they were studying Morgellons patients, they were using the best testing methods available to see if the Lyme bacteria was in there. And prior to about 2012, the testing methods, even on a DNA analysis level, weren't the best. They improved mm -hmm. after about 2012, 2013, so that the researchers consistently demonstrated that the bacteria they were finding was in fact Lyme bacteria. Recently, uh, this past December in Europe, they accomplished a study where they took Lyme bacteria and human skin cells and they put them together and the bacteria actually went inside the skin cells. This is something that scientists have been observing for decades. Uh, the bacteria loves those skin cells, but when it goes in there, it actually changes or screws up how those skin cells make uh, skin and hair. And okay. so in Mexico, they call Morgellons cactus man disease. Okay, because, <laughs> never yeah, heard that term before. What's happening is that when the bacteria goes inside these skin cells, the cells start to make like fingernails there, okay? And the fingernails are growing reverse. Instead of outwards away from the body, it grows inwards down into the muscle and tissue, okay? And it pierces it. So literally people were walking around with Morgellons have fingernails all over their bodies growing inside towards their muscle tissue. Wow. Stabbing that's, them. That's amazing. So, so ingrown hairs from hell. Well, it's still grown fingernails in places where fingernails should not be growing. Nice. Uh, Sounds fingernails, right. Yeah, they're made of keratin. So a, okay. a skin cell can make collagen and keratin, but when that bacteria gets inside the cell, it changes how much of those proteins that cell makes, which direction it makes them, how fast it makes them, what color it makes them. 
all sorts of things that that cell is programmed to accomplish, it can't accomplish nominally because that bacteria is living inside it. Wow. Yeah, so um, a quick search on, on Google will uh, bring this up right here. Um, you, you go over here, you type in chemtrails and Morgellons, 136,000 results. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of people who are really focused on this and I you know if if anybody's been to climateviewer.com you've seen my propaganda page um fear is the path to the dark side and fear porn not a good thing um I don't particularly approve of it and we try to dispel fear with facts because um people tend to fear that which they do not know so we don't want that and we want to try to get down to some of the science behind this so if you instead of going to google um and typing in chemtrails and you head over to google scholar and you type in morgellons and lime you're probably going to be on a little better track to finding out the answer to the mystery of the morgellons disease um so Real quick, I've got a couple papers up here that you had, that you had mentioned. Um, I, this one in particular, I found the mystery of Morgellons disease, infection, or delusion. Um, exploring the association between Morgellons disease and Lyme disease. Identification of Borrelia burgdorferi. <laughs> See how I practice that? Tell me, to, let's do it for us, Jeremy. Yeah, Borrelia burgdorferi. Now they call it Borrelia because it bores into tissues and bone. Okay. Yeah, Ber Berdorferi because it was William Berdorfer, uh, the scientist who discovered it back in 1976. I hope I got that right. Okay. Yeah. And, and you had mentioned uh, previously that basically that they had discovered Lyme disease in the ice, in, in an ice man. T yeah. Tell me about that. Well, let's talk about Plum Island. And uh, actually, before we get to Plum Island, can we talk about the nanotechnology? Do we have enough time to uh, address the robots in the chemtrails? Sure, sure. I can I can bring that up on the screen. Give me just one second. So I just uh, want to make the point that everything I just talked about with that Borrelia bacteria did not require any kind of uh, artificial intelligence or nanotechnology to accomplish. And that's pretty much the going theory and why you see uh, chemtrails and Morgellons because people assume that these strange symptoms are can only be caused by robots that are being seeded in with the clouds yeah. obviously we know that's not the only way but we also know that you cannot identify uh artifacts on visual interpretation alone you need to have a chemical analysis whenever there's chemical analysis of the morgellons fibers they do not show up or return as wires i was on rex bear's show um leak project and we talked about the Morgellons fibers, and he asked me, uh, he told they look like wires. I'm like, yeah, they look like wires, but in fact, they're hollow pieces of skin. They're hollow tubes of human skin because that bacteria has gone inside the skin cell and has caused it to overproduce in an infinite amount. It doesn't know when to stop. It doesn't know what kind of skin to make, collagen or keratin, or in what quantities it's supposed to because that bacteria has messed up its programming. Wow, wow, okay. So that's a that's a great explanation. Okay, so now what he was talking about with the the attack nanobots and and kind of the the root of a lot of this, you know, it's coming from the chemtrails. Um, I wrote a paper back in 2015 called Chemtrails, Calmatives, and Terrorism. And what I did was there was this thing called owning the weather in 2025, and most people only focus on that. What they don't focus on is you know bioterrorism and biodefense facilities like the sunshine project talked about the joint joint non-lethal warfare weapons directorate chemical weapons program and how you know people take natural bacteria and then they weaponize it so what you're specifically referring to is right down here near the bottom of the page um and this was also in the uh owning the weather papers Excuse me, let me go back. Apparently, I got to update my link there. But UAV constellations, um, this is from a different paper. This in links right there. Uh, this is not in the Owning the Weather 2025 papers. You have to actually read the whole set to be able to get to this. But 
provide precise control for aerosol dispersal, allow controlled suspension of airborne particles, enable weather control over localized areas. And this is UAV constellations or unmanned aerial vehicles. Well, the paper that's even more important is in 2025 operational analysis. And that link is right here. Um, where they mention attack microbots, sensor microbots, various deployment approaches are possible, include, including dispersal as an aerosol, transportation by larger platform, and full flying crawling autonomy. So what people are talking about, um, they're also known as MEMS, M-E-M-S. These are micro nanoparticle sensors and robots that the military could use for various purposes. So the chemtrail community, in many cases, has attributed um, what they're seeing in the sky coming from planes with dispersal of robots that are going in your body and saying that these nano robots are causing Morgellons when there's no science behind that at all. Um, and, you know, speculation's fun and all, but that's infotainment. That's not activism. That's not the truth. And, uh, all right. So now that we mentioned that back to you, brother, man. Yeah. Well, and you know, because we're both from South Carolina, this is a very religious uh, part of the country. And, uh, you know, we're very aware of stuff like new world order and end of times. And I think a lot of people equated this to, uh, implanting the mark of the beast in people. And they thought that the Morgellons fibers was going to be the antennas that would via Wi-Fi interconnect everybody into the hive-like consciousness. I've covered that on my YouTube show. Transhumanism is, is the term also that a lot of people um, talk about. And transhumanism, um, have you ever heard of shadow run? Yeah. Yeah, I was a I was a Dungeons and Dragons player, and one of my favorite uh, settings was called Shadowrun, and that's exactly what they talk about the the symbiosis of uh, you know man and machine. You know, it's also known as Synbio or uh, Cynthia. These are terms that are being thrown around now, and it's synthetic biology. Uh, and, you know, we all know that they're rewriting the DNA code and all that, but does that mean that you know? Delta Airlines is spraying more gallons on people with attack microbots and nanoparticles, you know, that are designed to give you more gallons. That's in my personal opinion, that's complete, utter bullshit, fear porn. And we don't approve of that. So uh, let's let's not do the fear porn today. Let's stick to the facts. Um, so back to you. What, what was the what was the next point we were going to make? Yeah. So tying it together and, and let's go into Plum Island. OK. First of all, and I've, I've promoted this on my page, um, there is no, nobody's coming forward with any kind of evidence of nanobots from the sky. Uh, they're not finding them in rain buckets and they're not pulling them out of their skin. Uh, the latest scientific study that came out on Morgellons demonstrated that the hexagonal crystals were in fact just glitter and was probably picked up from just like the environment, like somebody brought a greeting card home or they went through a Walmart and they got a little bit stuck in their sore. And that's why it's there. They didn't breathe it in and it didn't come out of their skin. Uh, that's what the study demonstrates. So, but from your research, you haven't found any evidence where people have said, oh, look, I found this nanobot that fell from the sky. <laughs> uh, and first of all, if they did, then they would have some pretty expensive equipment because um, most people should know this. I think it would be pretty obvious, but if it's a nanoparticle, you can't see it and you don't have an uh, expensive enough camera to look at it. So if you're seeing it on YouTube and they're, they're claiming it's a nanoparticle, they are full of shit. <laughs> cannot, you cannot interpret anything based on visual observation, interpretation alone. I fully agree with that. So to this Plum Island thing that that, uh, that you had referred to, I did a video um, quite a while back. This is March 16th, 2013. Um, Plum Island uh, failure causes virus during uh, virus release during Hurricane Bob. And I was doing some related research and I stopped to make this video simply because I read something that kind of blew my mind. 
Um, for those who don't know about Plum Island, it's an animal research center. It's off the the coast in the Atlantic Ocean. And I found this Department of Homeland Security report. Um, pretty scary stuff. It's very lengthy. Um, the title of it is National and Bio Agro Defense Facility Draft Environment Impact Study Public Meeting July 24th, 2008. And in it, I, this really just took me by surprise. So basically, Hurricane Bob happened in 1991, and it goes like this. I'm just going to read it so that, that everybody can, at home can, can just go WTF. And following that, in August of 1991, Hurricane Bob hit Plum Island and knocked over the overhead power box, which the backup power, which was backup power for the facility. As a co consequence, freezers containing virus samples defrosted. Air seals on the lab were breached and animal holding facilities were where the vents uh, failed the fail-safe mechanism for air dampeners sealing off the facility to the to the open air also failed. Melted virus samples mixed with infected animal waste on the floor, and swarms of mosquitoes filled the facility. This took place in what was the USDA in what the USDA called the safest facility in the world on viruses. <laughs> so. Let me get this straight. This is a national biodefense facility. They call it the safest place in the world. And a hurricane comes along, knocks out power to the facility, and every single backup system along the way failed. The virus samples were all over the floor. They were mixed with animal poop, and mosquitoes were feeding on that. Um, Lyme disease was in that facility. Um, so that bring, brings about the possibility that something, that something that's been around since the Ice Age, Lyme disease, could have been weaponized. And if you have a weaponized bacteria, um, the Borrelia, that melted with a whole bunch of other samples and the mosquitoes fed on that. And then they were released into the population because mosquitoes didn't just stay in the building. Um, Jeremy and I had a good argument on Facebook about that. I said, well, you know, Lyme disease is all up and down the East coast on the, you know, the East side of the Appalachian mountains. Hell, my father had Lyme disease. So is it a possibility that, this is a weaponized form of Lyme disease. And how would you respond to that, Jeremy? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I would suggest that um, Lyme disease, the notion that it was ever at Lab 257 was only uh, originated from one source. And that was Michael C. Carroll's book, Lab 257. Okay. Uh, I'd like to read you an excerpt from a review of that book from a lady who claims that her father worked at Lab 257. And it's just a little small excerpt. It says, a disturbing reoccurrence in this book that I'm catching on to is that the author is presenting his theories as fact, when in actuality it has never been proven that there is, and there is no conclusive evidence that Lyme disease, swine fever, West Nile and Rift Valley fever have spread rampantly because of Plum Island. Okay. But so, and and then I would so I would suggest that also we have evidence of Morgellons occurring in the 18th century. Yeah. So that and and that's where I was like and I just learned that today. I said, "Oh my god, I'm looking at this paper here. Um you've got Morgellons 200 years ago." So the the idea that it was just some weaponized form of this kind of goes out the window. Well, like, good. Yeah, I'd like to respond to that. You know, we have a new phenomenon uh, that's just occurred within the past, I'd say maybe thirty years or so. And and do you know what that is? Tell me. Everybody has the internet. Exactly. Everybody has access also to cheap, affordable, and powerful microscopes. If you look at the videos on my YouTube channel, I'm zooming in at 200 times microscopy on a $17 Amazon scope. 
<laughs> That's pulling, pretty epic. <laughs> I'm pulling in twenty thousand views, but um, <laughs> and and the thing is, is that that before before the internet, before cheap microscopes, people with Morgellons went to the psych ward to die. Yeah. That's that's my hypothesis. I think that the spread of if you look at the map of the reporting of Morgellons over the years and how it started in Texas, California, uh, and Florida, that, that's just about the same place that people were getting internet access, okay, the in mass, and about the same times that the reporting was occurring. And it usually started with uh, scientists, microbiologists, Mary Leito, who had a high powered microscope already. But then more people started getting their hands on microscopes and by visual interpretation, uh, claiming what they saw was what they thought on YouTube and on the web pages. And that's why we have people claiming the fibers are wires. And, and, and that makes sense because, you know, what, you know, there's a great saying, believe none of what you hear and half of what you see. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and and that's where I'm at. You know, I'm always um, hypercritical of people who are just, you know, they, they, they're so certain in their beliefs. And that's why, you know, I challenged you with this. I said, well, what about the Plum Island thing? You know, is it possible that the Lyme disease was weaponized? You did mention that the Japanese weaponized um, uh, yeah. spirochetus? Spirochetus? Yeah. So yeah, Borrelia is a spirochete, and so is uh, syphilis. Uh, syphilis causes uh, bovine digital dermatitis, uh, which is cow Morgellons. Uh, yeah, you do want to look that one up. The association wow. of uh, uh, Morgellons and uh, or, or the uh, uh, <laughs> and bovine digital dermatitis. But um, uh, regarding weaponizing uh, Lyme, it happened in World War II. A lot of uh, nations did it: the Japanese and the Germans. But I want to point out what they didn't do was what everybody thinks, which is they uh, integrated them with nanotechnology or they changed their genetics and made them a totally different creature. What they did was they cultured them in thicker mediums so that when they were moving, they had to exert more energy and they actually like built more muscle up, if you can imagine. They, they cultured them in these thick mediums, human blood. They found a way to culture them in that. And so they made these super virulent forms of the bacteria just by strength training. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's there. So they tried to intensify the effects of it is what you're saying. Well, Borrelia and the reason why they call it Borrelia is because it bores. It's a spirochete because it spirals as it's boring. Okay. And what they did was, they said, look, okay, mice blood is kind of thin where you would typically find this spirochete. And mm -hmm. so they put it inside human blood and then it had to work out because human blood is thicker to travel through. So they had to exert like three times as much force to travel through the human blood and it made them stronger because they were working out. They were exerting more physical force to get through that culture medium. Okay. But yeah. And, and, and this is also um, some pretty documented uh, history. Let me see if I can get this up on the screen real quick. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's my wife reminding me that I'm supposed to be on another interview right now. Um, I appreciate you making time to highlight our efforts. And no, it's all good. Let me let me get this one in there though, because it's it's priceless. So to what you're saying, um, one of the very first articles I ever did on uh, chemtrails was called "It Was a Conspiracy Military." Um, here, let's go to the top. It was a conspiracy military experiments on unsuspecting public. You can see this November tw um, 17, 2013. And in here is something similar. This is what the United States military was doing. Here's the original FOIA for that. And I cleaned it up so you guys can read it. But basically, Operation Big Itch, where they were talking about the survivability of dropping tropical rat fleas for biological warfare. Um, Operation Big Buzz, where they put 330,000 uninfected mosquitoes dropped from E-14 bombs and dispersed on the ground. Operation Mayday in 56, Savannah, Georgia, designed to reveal information about the dispersal of yellow fever mosquitoes in urban areas. Operation Dropkick in Savannah, Georgia, where un 
uninfected mm -hmm. <laughs> mosquitoes were released into residential neighborhoods in 56 test in Avon Park bombing range, Florida, where 600,000 mosquitoes were released. Um, and you can read a whole lot about that. Um, all over, I got a lot of this from Operation Sunshine, sunshineproject.org. Their website's been deleted from the internet. So, the, you know, militaries will take things like Lyme disease and this Borrelia and weaponize it. That is a distinct possibility. Now, do I personally believe that that's what we're seeing that attack microbots are boring into your skin or that, you know, Delta airlines is somehow delivering more gallons to everybody. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> it's a pandemic uh, condition. It's seen all over the world. Uh, but also, I just wanted to mention, you know, I don't know if we covered the Iceman already from 5,300 years ago. And yeah, that's what I wanted you to cover before we go, because this is killer. <laughs> people will say that, okay, Lyme bacteria wasn't virulent until uh, it was weaponized in Lab 257. But the Iceman, did you know this, had 61 tattoos? Yes, I do. I remember that part. Now, his tattoos actually corresponded with the degenerative uh, joints that where the Lyme bacteria was eating away at him. So his physician at the time was mapping the severity of his Lyme uh, degeneration. Wow. That's right. Uh, from 5,300 years ago. Uh, Lyme does and has been demonstrated to cause, a, and I'm talking about, there's a little bit of confusion with the relapsing Borrelia and the Lyme Borrelia. I personally think Borrelia is Borrelia and they both cause Lyme disease. Uh, but relapsing uh, Borreliosis, which is what I have serologic evidence for, uh, does produce a pulmonary fibrosis. It can result in a pulmonary fibrosis where the bacteria gets in the lungs and it hardens the tissues. That's what killed my dad. He suffocated to death because his lungs hardened up. It was ruthless. And uh, so you know, I have that up on screen. Um, people, that that's the pr the the proper way to pronounce it for uh, or to to type it in and search for it. But there's a distinct link between this bacteria. Lyme disease and Morgellons. And what I hope that you guys will do is check Jeremy's work out. It is available on Facebook at Morgellon Survey. His website is morgellonsurvey.org. And the man knows what he's talking about. Um, and, you know, just from my cursory searches, he has more than piqued my interest. So I will be looking into this further. Because I'm a curious, you know, I'm very curious. My crime is curiosity, and I absolutely hate fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So the best way we're going to be able to fight that is to know for certain what we're talking about here. Um, and before we go, I guess we should mention this. That's why I'm pushing for something called the Environmental Modification Accountability Act of 2018. Hashtag NMODAA. And the general idea is that we don't have a lot of transparency about what's going on in the skies overhead. And it leads to stories like attack microbots are giving you more gallons and the like. So I hope that you guys will check out in my accountability act, please uh, go check out more gallon survey and read through the research. You do the math yourself. And I think that you'll be pleasantly surprised that there is some science to this it is out there and there are people who are like Jeremy who are working real hard to get the truth out there. So Jeremy, I really appreciate you doing the show with me today, man. Um, I think that this is, this will be educational for a lot of people. There'll probably be a lot of poo throat because, um, generally speaking, people, uh, don't like to be told that they were wrong about anything. And I will kind of end with this, this quote from Carl Sagan. One of the saddest lessons in history is this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we have been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. So if you have already been, you know, really ingrained in the idea that for certain planes are spraying more gallons on you and you are unwilling to even look into the link between Lyme disease 
and uh, this Borrelia bacteria, the fact that it's been around for, it's been documented for 200 years, long before the first plane, um, and do, this, do some real research like uh, Jeremy has, then you are part of the bamboozle and it has you. So please, guys, review the material. Um, I think that you'll be pleasantly surprised that there is some information out there that you can really take to the bank. And I appreciate you doing this with me, Jeremy. Jim Lee, thanks for your efforts, man. Knowledge is power. It certainly is. And with that, I want to remind everybody at home, attack ideas, not people.